got a couple little stories for you today, both highly entertaining and educational and utterly germane and pertinent to your life, your well-being, and the very sense of purpose that gets you up and out of bed in the morning. Well, that might be a bit much, but this is great stuff, trust me. If you watched my videos on nutrition and flavor, then you're already familiar with nutritive reward, also known as nutritional wisdom, which is the notion that your body instinctively knows what it needs and can communicate those needs to you if you pay attention. In fact, you know what? Let's squeeze in another very short third story. It's absolutely true, no kidding. This is a good one, I promise. You see, a bunch of lab rats were given the choice between grape-flavored liquid and a cherry-flavored liquid. Both liquids had absolutely no calories, no nutrition whatsoever. There were no carbs in the juice, no fat, no protein, just water and flavorings. They could drink as much as they wanted of either one. But what the rats didn't know, because they were not well versed in the ways of science, is that They also had a feeding tube that went directly to their stomachs that completely bypassed their mouths and noses so that the scientists, very well-meaning I'm sure, could send stuff directly to their stomach without the rats smelling or tasting it. Now when the rats drank the cherry juice, the, the well-intentioned scientists, unbeknownst to the rats, sneakily pumped sugar in through the feeding tubes. And since the rats couldn't taste the sugar, and also not being well-versed in medical science, they had no way of knowing where the sugar was coming from. But, in no time flat, they developed a strong preference for the cherry-flavored liquid, even though the juice itself had no calories and was nutritionally nil, just like its grape-flavored counterpart. Now, just to be thorough, the scientists who were very well versed in science, and being the good thorough scientists that they were, they pulled the old switcheroo on the next rat pack, this time sending sugar through the feeding tube when the rats sucked grapes. Or that is, not actually grapes, but grape-flavored liquid, but nutritionally nil liquid, and guess what? The second rat batch just as quickly and just as strongly preferred the grape-flavored liquid. Now, the good, thorough, well-versed scientists repeated this thing several times, and without fail or exception, the rodents went for whichever liquid had a side dish of stomach tube sucrose. This is a great example of nutritive reward. Their bodies sent a message to their brains that there were calories to be had from drinking the juice that gave them the sugar, even though they had no way to taste the sugar whatsoever. Now, your body can do the same trick. The same thing has been studied in goats, sheep, birds, and even wasps. Monarch butterflies have a compound in their bodies that, when ingested by a bird, makes it miserably ill, and after eating just one, a bird will never, ever, ever eat another monarch butterfly ever again so long as it lives. That's a pretty neat trick that those of us inhabiting animal bodies can do. Our bodies can tell us what's good or bad for us. Have you ever had a tummy bug and just kind of instinctively known what it was that made you sick? Yeah, like that. That takes me to the next story, which is one of the ones I came here to tell you about in the first place. In 1926, a Chicago pediatrician by the name of Clara Davis did a study that would be so not okay to do nowadays, but we can still learn a thing or two from it, which I recommend, if nothing else, just to ensure that those babies didn't suffer in vain. Yes, babies. Clara persuaded a bunch of teenaged and widowed mothers to let her have their babies for six years. The babies were anywhere from 6 to 11 months old, and Clara, by all accounts, raised them with kindness and attention and abiding love. Uh, no, actually, I just made that part up to make you feel better. It was the 1920s, and I have no idea what kind of person she was. Like I said, this would be so not okay to do nowadays. Now, the babies were allowed to choose from 34 foods, none of which was refined sugar, butter, cheese, nor anything processed. 
Some of the items on the list might seem a little unusual to us nowadays, while others would seem totally mundane and banal, like barley, water, beef, salt, bananas, lamb, cabbage, haddock, potatoes, cornmeal, turnips, fish, milk, carrots, apples, orange juice, but also brains, bone jelly, and cod liver oil. Now, taste notwithstanding all whole natural foods. Now, at first, the babies wanted to sample everything, and Clara tried to do nothing at all to encourage or discourage any of their choices. After a little time, though, they started exhibiting preferences, and those preferences tended to shift and change over time. And here's where it gets really interesting. Those preferences matched the baby's life stages and pathologies. During growth spurts, they selected for protein. During more active periods, they preferred food high in carbohydrates. One child came down with a case of rickets and naturally selected cod liver oil, which is high in vitamin D. Now, who ever heard of a child actually seeking out and choosing cod liver oil? I've never tried the stuff. That was generations before mine, though its foulness is the stuff of legend. But nonetheless, this child couldn't get enough of it, and it cured their rickets. There were a couple of other children who also came down with rickets, and while they didn't go after the cod liver oil, they did in fact seek out other foods rich in vitamin D to successful effect. Now, isn't that story interesting and disturbing on so many levels? So many levels. I mean, Clara's monstrous stunt could be the envy of any mad scientist, but we can learn a lot from it. I have no idea what became of the babies, by the way. Just hopefully they didn't get put in petri dishes or test tubes and they were allowed to live, well, I can't say good lives, but at least not completely effed up lives. I can only hope. If anyone watching this video knows anything about Clara's subjects, I I'd love to hear about it. They'd be centenarians by now, which would in itself be quite telling. Still, there's part of me that really wants to believe that they survived relatively undamaged, but then again, who among us ever really does, really? Am I right? But it is one of the best cases for nutritive reward I've ever heard. Our bodies have this superpower of telling us what we need. Now, I need to make clear that this does not mean caving to every craving for a Krispy Kreme and cocktail, but with a little attention, maturity, and common sense. I really believe that you can learn to read those signals from your body. But yeah, common sense is the most important ingredient in any healthy diet. Which takes us to the third story, which is a story about my getting it very, very wrong once upon a time. Have you ever noticed that most people who want to talk about nutrition all seem to have a story about how they fell into bad physical health because of their flawed ways of looking at food, and then some kind of revelation saved their life and health? Well, this is mine. There's an adage you might have heard before that says you can't outrun a bad diet. Well, I learned that the hard way. See, a long, long time ago, I firmly believed that you could eat pretty much whatever you want so long as you exercise. And as I'm sure you've heard, there are still people towing that line. It's sometimes called the calories in, calories out perspective. And it's very popular among the makers of junk like soft drinks and fast food. It's the notion that any food can be part of a healthy lifestyle if you just move your body enough. And I was a devout adherent to that perspective. So there I was, eating fast food breakfast five days a week, plus restaurant food for lunch every day, and going to the gym with the devotion of a Shaolin monk. But I still had a lot of belly fat. I could just barely squeeze into a 38 waist size. So I started paying a little more attention to my diet, specifically by following the conventional wisdom of the time by avoiding fat and especially saturated fat, and loading up on supposedly healthy things like brown rice. But I continued to increase on the horizontal scale, so I upped my game at the gym. And that's when I noticed something. I saw pretty much all the same faces every night. People grunting and sweating and making themselves miserable, just like the program says. But like me, they weren't getting any thinner. All that suffering and no reward. Well, that's when I also changed my approach to exercise because I'd learned something about the endocrine system. 
You see, it turns out that when you experience trauma, your body produces the hormone cortisol. Cortisol causes you to store fat on your belly, which is one of those things that was very useful to our way, way, way back ancestors, but it's become one of those harmful vestiges, once useful but now harmful. To us, the first generation of humans in history or prehistory to actually get sick because food is too plenty, that cortisol is bad news. Now, when I learned that, I thought about all those miserable people at the gym enduring regular and self-imposed discomfort and often motivated by a low self-body image. I mean, let's just say they probably were not feeling great about themselves in the first place while also putting themselves through a kind of torture. And the worst thing about it, I was one of them. The whole reason I went to the gym was because I was unhappy with the shape of my body, and that dissatisfaction was very much at the top of my mind. On top of that, I adhered to the mantra, no pain, no gain, and so I sought out as much pain as I could stand. I was subjecting myself to as much pain as possible while also feeling completely crappy about myself. Was it possible, I wondered, if my body was interpreting that whole experience as a type of trauma? <laughs> Do you think? It seemed pretty plausible at the very least, so I changed that too. I didn't stop exercising, but it was late spring and the days were beautiful, so I just started riding my bike, but really I should say strolling on my bike. I didn't give myself any goals except to just have fun. I didn't aim for any particular speed or mileage or heart rate. I just rode for the pure joy of it. Now, I need to stop right here and acknowledge that some people love going to the gym, and that's great. Good for you. I am not one of your people, but we can still be friends. So the point here is not to demonize the gym. It's more about the importance of doing things that make you happy, whether that's hiking, biking, climbing, pickleball, or yes, even going to the gym. About that time, though, I also started learning more about how the body processes fat and carbs. It should go without saying that there are a lot of different perspectives on this, and I'm not here to endorse or deny any of them. But at the time, I decided to give a high-fat, low-carb diet a try. I cut carbs down drastically. I started cooking with huge, shameless dollops of coconut oil. I completely gave up my beloved brown rice. And as it turned out, the belly fat started coming off, and I loved that, but something didn't feel right in my body. I started feeling, uh, I don't know how to describe it. Best I could do at the time was to say I felt carb-starved. It's possible I was just going through some kind of withdrawal, which has been known to happen, but it felt more like just low energy. I needed energy to go out and have fun, so I decided to let myself eat all the healthy carbs I wanted, like fruit which turned out to be mostly melon. I couldn't get enough of it, but I did make a point of mixing it up and eating a variety of cantaloupe, honeydew, watermelon, canary, or whatever other thing I ran across. I also made sure to eat lots of other fruits like apples, strawberries, blueberries, blackberries, and every other color and hue berries. I also kept cooking with the shameless dollops of coconut oil. I had decided to not be afraid of healthy carbs or healthy fats. To be sure, there are unhealthy fats and unhealthy carbs out there, and I tried to avoid them as much as possible, so no trans fats, no soft drinks, and stuff like that. As for the rest of my diet, I made myself a simple rule. I didn't eat anything unless I either made it myself or could if I wanted to. So a nice salad was fine, because I, I could make that myself if I wanted. Same even went for the occasional cookie. I had to read the ingredients, though. If I saw things on there that I didn't know anything about, like emulsifiers and glutamates or other chemistry set kind of stuff, it was off limits. But if it was a short ingredient list like butter, flour, sugar, salt, then that was okay. In moderation, of course. Like I said, the most important ingredient is common sense. Now, obviously, I couldn't make my own melon or raise my own fish, but those were simple foods with a single ingredient, right? I also ate a lot of glass noodles, which are made from mung beans and water. Simple enough. You get the idea. And it was awesome. The fat kept coming off, but more importantly, my happiness quotient went way up. I felt so good. And I ate what I wanted. I listened to my cravings and the things my body wanted. 
I totally loaded up on glass noodles, shrimp stir-fried in coconut oil, roast chicken, homemade kimchi, and every color of melon imaginable. Riding my bike and hiking and walking just because I felt like it. And don't you know, I lost 35 pounds, nearly 20% of my total weight. But more importantly, I was having fun and finding simple joy in the foods and the biking and the hiking and the cooking. I got down to where 32 is a little loose. This is all about 10 years ago, and I should note that the fat stayed off. No rebound or yo-yo bullshit. At the time, it felt easy because I was having fun. Now, this is just one person's story. You should not take this as advice or recommendation, and I am most certainly not selling diet books. What I do suggest, though, is that you look at the principles at play here. Exercising in a way that you enjoy and makes you joyful, you know, like children used to do. Eating like Clara Davis's babies by eating the way your body tells you to eat. Getting enough knowledge to know at least the basics of what goes on in the body. Balance the enjoyment of things and seeking out what you know is good for you without making yourself miserable. You gotta think for yourself though and you gotta make your own plan. That's why it's important to learn about nutrition. Instead of following gurus, get smart and make your own decisions. Instead of trying to follow a plan, arm yourself with basic understanding of nutrition and combine what you learn with what your body tells you. There's an actual medical condition called orthorexia, which describes a person who is overly obsessed with eating a perfect, healthy diet. Now, you might wonder what could possibly be wrong with that, but for one thing, it can lead to malnourishment, but it can also rob you of your joy and interfere with your social relationships. I don't recommend it. Again, make sure to include a healthy serving of common sense in every meal. Now, I'm not saying that any particular diet is wrong or bad, whether it be Mediterranean, keto, vegan, pegan, Atkins, or any of the others. Every single one of those has an alphabet soup of PhD and MD researchers and endorsers and surrogates, and as I said in episode one, I read a lot of their books, so more power to them. But I will quote one of my favorites, Mark Hyman, in saying that your body is the best doctor in the room. Read the books. Learn what you can, but most importantly, make good decisions. It's probably worth noticing that every single one of those enlightening documentaries you've watched, and a lot of them are truly excellent, well-conceived, informative, and based on good science, but I strongly suggest that you note the agenda. What are they selling you? Who's paying the bills? Now, that doesn't mean they're wrong, but just pay attention. I also take note when they seem focused on tearing each other down. If what you have to say is true, then it should be true without the need to ridicule and insult others. And again, just because someone is getting paid doesn't mean they're duplicitous, but it might reveal their agenda and agendas matter. I'd also point out that for every thoroughly researched and impeccably reasoned diet plan that you hear about or read about, you can find an equally well-researched, impeccably reasoned diet plan that says just the opposite. We've all noticed that by now, right? For every panel of experts promoting keto, there's another panel of experts promoting vegan. And they're all super smart and they're all worth listening to. I feel like I can learn a lot by giving them equal airtime. So I listen to people promoting South Beach, Vegan, Paleo, Lion, and any others. As long as they're smart and fair-minded, I can learn a lot from any and all of them. And it's not as if more than one of them can't be right, right? Well, except the Breatharians. I draw the line there. That can kill you. At the end of the day, I endorse a food-based diet. I endorse listening to all of the experts, but remember, none of us knows everything. In future videos, we will go more in depth about specific foods and diets, but for now, I just really want to impress upon you the importance of balance. Don't become fanatical. Don't become orthorexic, and don't go around telling your friends how to live because, for one, we're all different, and for two, that's so annoying. Never judge people because you have no idea about their situation or their body. And as much as I promised to not sell you on a diet, there are a few simple things I strongly suggest. 
Remember, there are good fats and bad fats, just like there are good carbs and bad carbs. Eat the good ones and enjoy it. Avoid processed food, even if the ingredients are organic, gluten-free, non-GMO, or whatever. Organic, non-GMO, gluten-free, processed junk is still processed junk. Don't eat too much refined sugar. And notice I said too much. I'm going to have a little ice cream as soon as I'm done here. Avoid the drive through at all costs. Stay away from soft drinks. As for what some people call unpronounceable ingredients, avoiding them is not bad advice. But also bear in mind that, for example, tocopherol is just the chemical name for vitamin E, just as ascorbic acid is for vitamin C. Now, that being said, a short ingredient list with words that you can actually understand is a good sign. Avoid trans fats and meat processed with sodium nitrite. Eat more nuts. Eat lots of different colors. In general, judge foods on their quality rather than their category. For instance, instead of avoiding butter just because it's fat, look for good quality grass-fed butter. Instead of trying to eat less food, try eating more good food. And again, enjoy it. Another good rule is to shop the perimeter at the grocery store. That means that all the whole healthy foods tend to be along the walls. Things like fresh produce, meat, dairy, flowers, and... Okay, maybe not flowers. But do note that all the junk food is in the aisles. But this rule is also not perfect. Nut butters and olive oil are in the aisles. The perimeter is also where you're going to find all the sugary yogurts and processed meats. So again, it's more of a guideline than a rule. The reason the healthier foods tend to be on the perimeter is that they tend to be the fresh things that need to be restocked more often since they're perishable, unlike canned soup and cereal, which could probably outlive a bristlecone pine. Putting perishables on the perimeter just makes them easier to restock. Makes sense, right? In future videos, we'll go more in depth about how to choose quality foods, but for now, it's time to wrap up this video. And as always, just like every other creator here on YouTube, if you've enjoyed this video and if you'd like to see more of this type of content, do make sure to subscribe. If you'd like to be part of the food conversation, I strongly encourage you to speak your mind in the comments because, duh, I don't have all the answers either. But in the meantime, thanks so much for watching. I hope to see you next time. Ciao.